Hello, everyone. Should we should we begin? There may be a few other people joining us, uh, but it's a, it's a real treat to be here today with Professor Sandra Guerra Thompson from University of Houston Law School. And Sandy and I serve as court appointed monitors in the O'Donnell case, which is the first federal consent decree of its kind to implement bail reform. And so we're going to talk about the work we've been doing and, and, and what this case is all about. Um, and we have with us Hunter Alberton, who is a thrill here at Duke. And, and Hunter has been working with us and supporting our work since the very beginning, beginning with like reading, helping us read this consent decree and figure out all the different tasks that we're supposed to understand and monitor to looking at who's booked in the jail each week in, in Harris County, which includes Houston. Um, and so our, our plan was for, especially because, you know, you'll get to see him all the time. I'm here at Duke. Uh, I have Sandy start and, and introduce herself and her interest in bail reform in Texas. And then what, what things were like in Harris County before this consent decree and then how our work began. And then Hunter will talk about her work as a law student uh, as part of our team. And then I'll say some some other things that they, and, and anything they haven't covered, I'll talk a little bit more maybe about our, our recent year-end report, which just came out not much more than a week ago and, and what we've been finding. Uh, but really grateful to, to share the lunch hour with, with you all and introduce some, some of our, our work to, to folks at Duke. And, especially pleased to be able to introduce you all to, to my friend and my collaborator on this project, uh, Sandy Thompson. Good morning. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here. Uh, I guess I'll just start by sort of telling you how it is that I ended up um, serving as trustee and monitor for this consent decree. Uh, I'm a professor, as Brandon said, at the University of Houston Law Center. I teach criminal law. I've been there for many, many years. Um, and after about 20 years, 25 years of teaching and writing, um, I had a couple of experiences um, that maybe some of you can relate to, uh, getting those phone calls in the middle of the night um, saying, I'm in trouble, I'm in the jail, please help. And having to, um, to bail a loved one out of jail. And um, those experiences taught me a lot, you know, firsthand. And then the American Bar Association um, was very interested in this subject and they called me because I head the Criminal Justice Institute at the Law Center at UH. And they asked if, if I would be willing to host a statewide conference on pretrial justice. Um, so I did. Um, and uh, I, can you hear me well enough, Brandon? It was better just sure. now, but it was coming in and out a little bit. Okay, let me get a little closer. Oh, yeah, that's great. So, is that better? Okay, good, good. Uh, <laughs> you get me up, up close and personal now. Um, so anyway, I hosted a conference um, and I learned a lot more about the subject. And what I learned was that uh, we, had, we have really in most states a system very similar to what was um, in existence in Houston, um, by which uh, when a person was arrested, it really wasn't determined, there should have been a process for determining uh, whether that person was likely to come back to court or not, um, and whether they we think they would commit a crime uh, or not. And, you know, I started asking myself, um, you know, thinking about the person I was bailing out what would it take to get them to come back to court? And what the studies show is that the vast majority of people, if you tell them this is your court date and you must come or a warrant will it be issued for your arrest, it turns out most people will just show up. But that's not how the system worked. And um, in Harris County, there was a bail schedule. So regardless of how uh, little risk there was, of, of this person, you know, coming, not coming back to court, um, it was automatically set that, that they would have to pay several thousand dollars in bail money to be released. Um, now, uh, we use bondsmen, commercial bondsmen in this country, which is a weird, unique thing around the world. Uh, I think we're one of two countries. Um, and they take a non-refundable fee 
to get most people out of jail. Again, if there's no need for it, I started thinking, why? Why are we doing this? Um, and I started working for many years in the Texas legislature, um, trying to educate people about how this system didn't work. And we, we built up a momentum because there was lots of interest coming from many directions um, to the point where we had a chief justice of the Supreme Court, the head of the Court of Criminal Appeals, all testifying in favor of it, the director of the Office of Court Administration. Um, you know, I talked to the head of the, the Texas Tea Party. I talked to the Republican Caucus. I talked to everybody. I explained to them uh, that this was not, not a good system for taxpayers, who were locking up a lot of poor people for no good reason. Um, it was uh, very bad in terms of the, the people who get stuck in jail, who don't have someone to come get them out. They tend to be the, the most vulnerable, the sickest people, um, people with mental illness um, and veterans, uh, foster children. Um, and this really started to resonate. So we had a lot of groups like the uh, American Diabetes Association and many organizations that started to take an interest. And yet, and yet we couldn't beat the, the bondsmen. Um, they're back, they're, they're like the, the bondsmen you see on, on the street, on the, around the courthouse um, are small business people, but they are backed by major insurance companies. And this is the most lucrative kind of insurance that they sell because they never have to pay out. I mean, they virtually never pay out. It is just easy money. Um, and of course the bondsmen, well, they're just small business people and they wanna make a living. Um, so I don't begrudge them their you know, concern about bail reform. Um, but the truth is that we don't need this industry. And um, so, you know, like I said, we just couldn't beat them in the, and I don't know that we will ever beat them in the legislature, as long as legislators need um, to get reelected. So the next best thing, uh, as far as I could see, was this consent decree um, through the federal court. So when Brandon asked me if I'd be willing to do this with, with him and if I thought it was a good idea, I said, you know, all the people we would be working with in Harris County want this to work and they're smart. And so it's been a really pleasurable year seeing the developments. And I'm really honored to be working with your professor at Duke um, who has proven to be a, really quite a, an inspiring leader uh, for the whole team. Um, and so it, it has been all positive other than the politics the politics of money, and that's the, the continues to be this, the challenge that we face. So I'll, I'll leave it at that and turn it over to, to Hunter. Um, that was great. It was, it was really helpful to hear your perspective on that. I, I hadn't heard it before um, myself. Um, I got started on this work um, when I saw a research assistant position posting for Professor Garrett in the Duke Law Daily, and um, I had really enjoyed my evidence class and um, saw that Professor Garrett did a lot of evidence um, related work, but when I met with Professor Garrett and he mentioned this potential work in Houston, I was immediately drawn in because I'm planning on um, working in Houston after law school. So I had never really thought about um, bail reform. Um, and I felt like as soon as I started the work, I'd walked into this whole new area of injustice that I'd never um, really been educated about um, before. And I started this work in January 2020, um, which was actually my first, you know, kind of task was reviewing the monitor application. And um, I did work on the um, the deliverables within the consent decree, which essentially reads like a contract. Um, it's a 69 some page document. 
um, with deliverables and action items. And kind of my task was going through that um, and, and finding who was responsible for what um, when they needed to have it completed and making a schedule for all the, all the parties, which of course, Professor Garrett and Professor Thompson and others reviewed. Um, and, and that kind of, you know, sets out the timeline for how this um, transition to, to cashless bail for misdemeanors would, would go for the next few years. Um, in terms of my, my work um, after uh, that kind of initial uh, schedule building, um, I, along with um, a few undergraduates, look at the jail rosters that um, we get, which include all misdemeanor defendants uh, in Harris County. And um, we're looking for, you know, any inconsistencies or potentially any um, defendants whose, whose hearings for bail may be violated um, the, the new rule. So, you know, the new rule, um, and you, you all may know this, but it, it is essentially um, takes away cash money bail for most misdemeanors. A few are, are taken out, like domestic violence, repeat offenders, DUI, repeat offenders, um, cases where people have skipped their court dates. Um, if they're not one of these cases, then they they need to have a personal recogn recognizance bond. So we're looking at all these and making sure that if it's a carve out case, reasons are given for, um, you know, why uh, this person was denied bail. If it's not that they got a non-monetary bail. Um, and we're also observing the live Zoom court in Houston and um, actually watching these probable cause hearings, um, taking notes that, you know, Professor Garrett and others review so it's been really, really interesting work. And I think that the importance of it is, um, like Professor Thompson said, most of our stakeholders, the officials, people in the county, they're personally committed to carrying out this consent decree work. They want to see it go through. But just knowing that someone, even if it's a you know, low qualified law student is watching, um, I think just reminds them that there is this new rule and um, you know, someone will be there kind of questioning the every decision for every individual defendant, everyone gets reviewed. Um, I've learned a lot doing this work in a lot of surprising ways. Um, so I, in my summer associate position, um, I've been going through transactional practice groups and you know, young transactional attorneys build schedules with action items based on multiple contracts. And so that work was directly applicable to a completely you know, different area of the law for me. And um, the work that we do with Professor Garrett involves a lot of Excel um, for data collection and, and analysis. And that's been directly applicable to my venture capital class, um, you know, building liquidation waterfalls for bankruptcy. It's kind of similar Excel sheets. And then also my prim criminal procedure class. Um, I got into my criminal procedure class and I realized that for months I had been watching you know, kind of all these rules played out in real time and didn't even realize how much I was learning. Um, so, you know, I guess if, if anybody's watching, thinking about doing research assistant work, my advice would just be to keep an open mind. Um, since the beginning of law school, I've wanted to be a transactional attorney and I just was surprised by how much I liked evidence and then reached out to Professor Garrett and was surprised by how interested I was in bail reform. And I found this interest in criminal procedure and litigation that I just didn't know that I had um, before law school. And now I, I want to find ways to work that into my career after. Um, so, yeah, if anybody's thinking about it, just, you know, um, do it, even if you're not, even if you don't know if you're interested in criminal procedure yet. Um, and with that, I'll hand it off to Professor Garrett. Oh, thank you, Sonia. We're so grateful for all the work that you've been doing over, over more than a year now. And uh, that was really interesting for, I had no idea that like a, a what, a bankruptcy waterfall? Uh, <laughs> that, 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 there, that there are similarities between tracking what happens in bail hearings and, and tracking what happens, I guess, to, uh, to money after a bankruptcy. I don't know if that's really what you were, what that is. <laughs> uh, Just the same Excel formulas can apply uh, okay. for analyzing <laughs> data. Uh, but it is it is true like in general like there, there's a lot that sandy and i've learned about just the kind of project management as part of this that's it's really important in lots of areas of law that things have to be done at certain times and there's certain tasks and dividing it up can be complicated and we all have to collaborate and sometimes we're working with information that's on paper sometimes we're working with information on some awful websites sometimes it's videos and we need to turn it all into something 
that people can understand. Um, so to, just to say a little bit more about what, what this bail reform is and why it's important. Um, so the way things worked at a bail hearing, and we've seen some of these videos too, you know, before these reforms were passed, these hearings were often like 30 seconds long, a minute long. Uh, the, the person who had been booked on a misdemeanor sometimes wasn't even allowed to talk. And it kind of didn't matter who they were or what they had to say anyway, because a judge would just look at what they were charged with, look at a bail schedule and say, oh, $1,000, $2,000. Didn't matter whether the person was homeless, had no money. It uh, didn't matter whether they, what, what you know, public safety concern there was or was not. Like it, it could be someone who's incredibly dangerous, but if they, if they can pay the bail bondsman $200, then they can make a $2,000 bond. You have to pay 10% up front and you don't get that back. Um, and that would be it. And so it was like very mechanized, you know, uh, assembly line justice. Hearings were quick, people were processed, you know, 60, 70,000 cases a year. You know, Harris County includes Houston, it's the third biggest metropolitan area in the country. And that was justice and misdemeanor cases. And so you had huge numbers of people who, who couldn't, pay the $200 or the $500. They were homeless, they were indigent. Um, they needed the money to make their rent or maybe they they paid the money and they really couldn't spare it and they couldn't make their rent. Um, you had, you know, many at any time, hundreds of people in the jail because they were poor and, and, and that was it. Uh, some of those people died because of overdoses or suicide, you know, people in behavioral health crisis. Um, and you had many people who, you know, did get out, they would often there'd be a lawyer waiting there to take their guilty plea. Um, because the only way to get out if you couldn't pay was to plead guilty and people would plead guilty and get out after, you know, four, 10, 12 days. Um, they would then have a misdemeanor criminal record. They would have to pay these fines. Um, they would have missed days of their job. Um, and, and so there'd be real consequences. Um, the litigation in this case was brought by a number of different civil rights groups and with some law firm support too. And so for those of you, you know, pro bono work, like there was some really impressive pro bono work in this case as well. You know, Sandy and I were not involved in that stage. We did not bring this case. We're not parties to the case. We're, we're outside, we're independent. Um, but the, the parties in this case, you know, fought quite a bit before we came. Uh, it was quite contested. And, you know, Harris County spent a lot of money defending this case. It went up to the Fifth Circuit. Um, you know, any, anytime you have a federal court case that's going up to the Court of Appeals and back again, like that's years of litigation, that's serious expenses. The district judge ended up making hundreds of pages of findings of supporting her conclusion. This is Chief Judge Rosenthal, uh, that there were serious constitutional violations involved. And when you have people jailed because they because their poverty, really, there were serious racial disparities in who was in the jail and who wasn't. And, and those opinions are really, really interesting to read and they're long uh, and really detailed. Uh, but ultimately, including I think because of the power of those factual findings and those judicial rulings, but also growing public awareness that this is just not okay. And some changes in leadership in Harris County, um, the, the judges, the county, they, they all decided that they wanted to, to do something about this and they didn't want to you know, take this case to trial and fight it tooth and nail anymore. Uh, even before this case settled, the judges voted on and adopted what, what's called Rule 9. And what that rule basically says, and that's kind of the frame, the, the, one of the core elements of this consent decree is in misdemeanor cases, you get booked. For most cases that aren't particularly serious misdemeanors, you get released. They take down your information so that you can be contacted when it's your time to come to court. But we don't need to see you until it's your time to come to court. And that's it. Uh, for a set of six, what they call carve out offenses, uh, like a, a repeat driving while intoxicated or domestic violence misdemeanor, or someone who's violating bond or parole or condition of supervision. For those, you don't just get automatically released, you get a hearing. But the hearing doesn't look like that 30 second hearing in the past. Everyone is given a public defender, they have a lawyer to represent them and make the case. The judge has to follow a constitutional standard following United States versus Salerno, they have to have clear and convincing evidence. And so not just, oh, I think this person might not show up in court or might be a danger. Maybe I'll keep him in the jail. Like it's a, it's a heightened standard and they have to make factual findings. Um, if uh, the person's entitled to get a, re a review of that hearing officer's decision the next day by a, by a judge, uh, the, the public defender 
is to be given a chance to meet with the client and get discovery. We're really proud that there's now electronic discovery before these pretrial hearings. There are not many places in the country where there's discovery like that. And, uh, and not only that, but um, the conditions must be the least restrictive. And so even if a person's released, they can't be loaded up with unnecessary conditions that burden their life in the community without any, any, any uh, sufficient benefit. The consent decree says a lot more too. It, it talks about how uh, there needs to be a more flexible and clear system for when you need to be in court. And in the past, it wasn't always clear, like is a judge going to, uh, like, am I gonna be arrested for not showing up at this misdemeanor hearing or is it okay for my lawyer to be there or is it okay to reschedule? It might be up to the judge. Um, and, you know, in a, a big area like Harris County, it's a big burden on some people to have to find a way to get, get downtown for a, a court appointment. Uh, it didn't come up so much if people pleaded guilty to get out of the jail and then their case was over. But now, but now these misdemeanor cases are going forward and, and there's a new system now for, for scheduling and rescheduling court appearances. They're, they're also developing a, a notification system so you can sign up and get text notifications. Like, so it's like a doctor's appointment where you actually know like, that you have to be in court. And so all of this is, it's a big undertaking to implement a system like this. A lot of it has been implemented over the year that, that Sandy and I and our team have been monitors. Uh, there, there's still plenty of work to do. And we can talk more about what we found and what we've been doing. Uh, but uh, before you have to go, Sandy, do you wanna talk a little bit more about, about um, lots of things to talk about. There's our community working group. There are some of the um, kind of tensions in the system in Houston where you have our misdemeanor case, but you also have felonies and other cases. There's all the questions about uh, different vulnerable populations and who gets caught up in the misdemeanor system. I feel like there's so many different things that, that we could talk about. And, and, and please start posting questions and start raising your uh, you know, hands if you wanna ask questions and we can start answering some of those too. Yeah, sure, sure. I mean, you know, like, like you were saying, it's a, it's a comprehensive, decree and again to be honest I, I really feel like you know, the, the title of the program is a blueprint for reform and this is certainly one blueprint but the word blueprint got me thinking yesterday and um, you know what one issue for me at least you know because I have concerns beyond just Houston and Harris County um, because this system that that we're talking about this that that has change, right? The, but the money bail system is one that exists still um, throughout virtually all of the rest of, of, uh, of Texas. I mean, I, it, there are changes going on in, in the Dallas uh, County area, as well as Travis County, which is the Austin area, has had a much more um, less cash-based system uh, for a long time. But, um, but most places still have this. And, and the country, and so you know, how do you how do you change this, this system? Is is one question in my mind, and I think you know the a legislative solution is really best. It's the easiest way to do it, um, but the politics are very tough, um, and all the stars have to align for states to get real change, um, like like we have seen in some other states, like Kentucky, Washington D.C., different areas. Have much better systems, um, but they made change at the state level a long time ago. Um, short of that, then a, a comprehensive consent decree like this um, can be uh, very effective. The the one we're operating under is only applicable to misdemeanors, and you know, and this is something that creates a lot of confusion um, because you get you still have a cash bail system for felonies. Sometimes the people who were um, released on felonies, you know, they, they put a post a five uh, a five thousand dollar bond by paying a bondsman five hundred dollars and they're out, or or even several thousand dollars that they might pay a bondsman on a, on a bigger bond, um, and then they commit another crime and all of a sudden people are crying about bail reform, and what they're not realizing is that those aren't the people that we're uh, overseeing at all. Um, so it's very it's very challenging to try to explain these issues to, to, to people um, who are really concerned and, and 
worry that that there's going to be a revolving door of criminals that they that nothing's going to happen to them. They get arrested and they're immediately out, and it's not exactly true. What what is the case is that now the poor person has the same opportunities as the person with money has under a cash bail system. Uh, and what what the studies show is um, it's it's like a, a it's a it's a double whammy because if if you're poor under a cash bail system and you get stuck in jail, like Brandon was saying, you're going to have to uh, plead guilty really to get out. Otherwise, you're going to be in there for months um, trying to go forward with your case, and you're at a real disadvantage in trying to see your lawyer, talk to your lawyer, and and get any kind of investigation of your case. On the other hand, if you get out on cash bail. Um, you're coming to court in a suit. Uh, you're you're continuing with your job. You're you're you don't lose your home. You don't lose your children, um, and you can work with your lawyer. So, the the disadvantages to the poor person are really extreme. Um, and in addition to that, what we have also found is that if you're stuck in jail for just a couple of days, two to three days, statistically that person is going to be so much more likely to commit another crime in the future than if you had released that person. And the study can't really tell us why that is, but we can surmise, right? We, we can, it doesn't take rocket scientists to figure out that if you're stuck in jail for two to three days, that's enough time to suffer a severe trauma, have health effects, lose your job, lose your apartment, lose your children, have everything in your life fall apart. Um, and so, you know, I'm really proud of the work we're doing. And um, my role in, on the monitorship is to um, continue to organize the community around this issue um, because you have to have buy-in from the whole community. And again, the messaging uh, that's coming from the insurance companies is, is misleading um, and inaccurate. And uh, so, you know, we spend a lot of time with um, leaders in the community, having them talk to county stakeholders, showing them the data um, and um, just trying, trying to get the community uh, to, to recognize the benefits of, of what's going on. You know, we uh, um, we wish that that there was like more understanding in the community that that there is a whole blueprint here for bail reform. Unfortunately, we don't get asked a lot of questions about how great it is that there's e-discovery now before bail hearings, that there are public defenders there, that the hearings are fairer. We don't get a lot of people asking us about the new court appearance policy or the fact that people are gonna get texts and there's gonna be like a sensible way to know what, when you're supposed to go to court. Um, a lot of the questions we've been getting are about, well, with all these people free, is there more crime? And, uh, and it's understandable, particularly during the pandemic, um, you know, misdemeanor offending like isn't salient to a lot of people. I mean, like traffic offenses, a lot of little offenses, um, they certainly impact people, but it's not like big news. Um, big news crimes, though, are up, right? There, there have been a spate of shootings, including, you know, shootings that result in deaths in jurisdictions large and small here in Durham around the country. And, you know, we know it's a national phenomenon. Um, but that said, wherever it's happening, people want to know why and are looking to blame something. And we've had to explain that, look, you know, misdemeanor bail does not have anything to do with the shootings in Houston any more than the lack of misdemeanor bail reform has anything to do with shootings in another place. Um, there, there are other causes for firearms violence, but, um, you know, it's not, uh, there, there has been no bail reform that has anything to do with that. So there's like one, one figure in our monitor report that people keep pointing to in our latest report, we included more figures. We included a whole series of them showing how before and after these, these uh, misdemeanor bail reforms adopted in Houston, uh, you don't change in new cases of misdemeanors. And uh, 
we weren't totally surprised to see this. We, we figured that having many more people freed who uh, we suspected did not pose a real public safety concern would be a good thing for the community. And we, we show in lots of detail that no matter how, way, how you slice the data before and after this change, we see, if anything, a decline in, in, in most respects in repeat offending. Uh, but that said, you know, we also dig into some other problems and concerns, and there's been a lot of work to do, and there are real challenges and real things that we need to understand. For example, uh, you know, the people who are twice as likely to re repeat offend are people who are homeless and have flags for severe mental illness. We should think about that repeat offending in a different way if these are vulnerable population members who keep coming back into the system. And that raises the question, well, is there something that we can do? And, and how do we understand what's happening in those cases? And so we really want to dig into that more to understand why some people keep coming back in these misdemeanor cases. Uh, and uh, we've, we've also continued to do work as, you know, our, in our role as monitor, we want to make sure that this consent decree is being followed and, and it's being um, meaningfully interpreted and used right. Uh, we had lots of concerns early on because these judges and the hearing officers are supposed to be following a clear and convincing constitutional standard. They're supposed to be making fact findings. But like in a lot of places, like the form where they would write down, well, this is the reason why we, uh, why we were imposing cash bail in this case. It was only, they only had like a little bit more than a line to write their reasoning. And how are they supposed to follow a constitutional standard? How are they supposed to make factual findings with just one little line? They would have lots of little abbreviations to try to fit like the characters that they could fit. It was like a tweet practically. And we don't want judges deciding to, you know, put someone in the jail based on a tweet. And so they, they were able to quickly say, okay, we can change the form so they can write a thousand words. There was no danger of judges writing a thousand words in a bail hearing. They don't have, you know, they may have 10 minutes now, but they don't have hours. Um, they do have real, you know, busy dockets. Um, but even there, you know, as we read their opinions, there just wasn't a habit, right, among these hearing officers of spelling out their reasoning and making sure that it was well supported. And so we've been, we've been looking at what they write in every single one of these hearings to understand um, what they were doing. Uh, they have discretion. They're the ones making the call, but we want to make sure that they're following the standards in this consent decree. And, you know, sometimes we would see blank opinions where that, that clearly doesn't follow the consent, consent decree, right? They, they're not making adequate findings if they're making no findings. And, and through a lot of work by the judges, they put a lot of work when we raise these concerns into fundamentally redesigning the form that hearing officers use so that it reflects the constitutional standards in this consent decree. And just a little over a week ago, they started using this new, this new hearing officer form, which we're really excited about. This, this is like way nerdier stuff than you probably want to hear about, but we, you know, these details really matter in terms of how people do their work and how they approach their jobs. And so, um, you know, Hunter was talking about this too. We, like, we have this landmark consent decree that people around the country are looking to as one model for bail reform, uh, but implementation really matters and details really matter, including like, you know, what are the fields in the form that the bail officer fills in? Or, you know, we've been seeing just, you know, um, slip ups or people getting you know lost track of in the jail because it's a big place and someone is in crisis and they get put someplace and then they don't have their hearing and they're supposed to have their hearing and and what are the systems you know sandy's been talking with the parties like we need to do like root cause analysis when something goes wrong we need to learn from it and improve our systems and this is not the kind of stuff that you learn in law school but it's just sort of it, it, it's what's involved in turning you know a constitutional command clear and convincing evidence and a legal command, a consent decree with all these detailed provisions, turning it into something that people can follow in the sheriff's office and judges and hearing officers and public defenders and all of us doing our jobs uh, from day to day. Um, and, uh, and, that, and that's been one of the real pleasures of, of this work is to try to un understand through this long-term process of collaboration, how to, how to make, make these aspirations and rules function well. Um, I want to see if we have some questions in the chat. So far, I haven't seen any. I think Kristen has a question. Oh, hi, Kristen, yes. Hey, Professor Garrett. Um, yeah, so I was 
Y'all, br y'all briefly mentioned um, changing composition on the courts as something that sort of led to the possibility of more bail reform. But I was wondering if you could talk more specifically because I know that like in 2019, Harris County like had you know brought on 17 new black female judges in a, in a very historic momentous occasion. And I just was wondering if you could talk more about how that affected the ability to get here and also the implementation of these reforms afterwards. Sandy, do you want to start? You know, you know Harris County. <laughs> Yeah, I'm sure. Learning. Sure. Uh, yeah, it, it's a it's interesting politically because the judges get sued individually uh, as a you know as a group, but you know they're all individually named, uh, and so they're parties to the lawsuit. But so is the county, and so trying to settle a lawsuit like that, it's you know it's like herding cats, and. Um, and uh, the judges were really resistant. The judges before 2018 were, were completely resistant to settling. Um, and so the county was really was stuck and, and, and the, pro the prior commissioners were supporting, you know, the fighting the lawsuit, but they were losing, even at the Fifth Circuit, they were losing. Um, then in 2018, the commissioner's court and all of the judiciary, uh, change color from red to blue and um, you just had a very different group of people who who didn't feel um, like they had to defend themselves anymore because the lawsuit wasn't initially brought against them right um, and so they were much more willing and they were new judges so they didn't they weren't vested in the old procedures in any way um, and so they were much more willing to to settle the case and the, as were the commissioners they wanted um, not only to settle the case, but they had a commitment, you know, to building the best, they, they, their goal is to build the best pretrial justice system in the country. Um, and that's what, you know, encouraged us to, to be willing to work with them, because otherwise, I think it would be, um, it would be very hard work uh, if we were working with people who were trying to undermine the, the consent decree. Um, so, you know, I, I think right now we're facing um, real challenges in this area because my understanding is that a similar lawsuit in Dallas is going to the Fifth Circuit and, um, and we could see a very different kind of ruling in that case that could affect um, Harris County as well. And, you know, so the future is, is a little bit uncertain right now. There's like I say, a lot of money um, in favor of a cash bail system. Um, and it's, it just becomes a very political, um, a very political issue. But I, you know, I, I'm still hopeful that with a federal judiciary and lifetime appointments, um, that maybe, maybe things will be okay. <laughs> so we'll see. Yeah, I mean, in our case, we have a consent decree, we have a final judgment. Um, we feel comfortable that we can do our work for the six years ahead, building a really solid misdemeanor system in Harris County. But it's not lost on us. It's not our job to look at the felony cases, but it's not lost on us that although the misdemeanor population is much smaller, that the jail in Harris County is you know, near capacity again, even during COVID and with an enormous number of COVID cases. And so you sort of do a lot of work in one part of the system, but if you don't have remedies that govern the whole system, uh, then you've only solved part of the problem. And, you know, it, it has been very state by state. There's been a bail reform movement in this country, but there's a movement to keep things the same. And we've had entire states pass bail reform measures. Illinois just did. Um, New York passed a bail reform measure, but then took some of it back. Uh, New Jersey passed some really important bail reforms, and it seems like implementation has gone well. And then you have states like California that passed a bail reform, which ultimately just kind of said each jurisdiction can do it at once. And so it's sort of a patchwork. Uh, there is There has been litigation in other parts of the country. Uh, there has been one case brought here in North Carolina in Alamance County, including uh, a civil rights corps, the ACLU, some of the same lawyers that were, or, or civil rights organizations involved in the Houston case. And they don't have a final judgment like we do in the Harris County case yet, but they do have a, a preliminary order, like a consent order between the parties, uh, which includes 
some of the same language as in O'Donnell. They're kind of following a little bit of the same model um, in terms of you know judges following a clear and convincing evidence standard and some of the um, the, the the guidelines. And so, you know, other jurisdictions are looking to what was done in in, in Houston. Um, there are larger questions about the role of risk assessment. You know, some jurisdictions like New Jersey took a risk assessment approach saying we want judges not to use sort of, you know, their own discretion. We want that discretion to be informed at least by a quantitative approach. Um, that's, you know, that, that's not a part of, of this misdemeanor consent decree. Uh, so there, there are a lot of different debates and approaches towards bail reform being considered around the country. And although, you know, there's, it, you know, it's not that many states that have made big changes so far. You know, 10 years ago, there were no states that were making changes. And, and just about every state looked a lot like Houston or everywhere in North Carolina, there were bail, bail schedules. There, there are still bail schedules almost everywhere in North Carolina. There's just a few counties that have done something different. And so, you know, that, I mean, no one talked about bail like in law school 10 years ago, 20 years ago. It was just, it was not a topic. Like pretrial justice was not a big focus. Um, you know, the, the bail reform movements had occurred, you know, decades past. Uh, but it's an urgent time because this, you know, we've never had jail populations like this in our country. I mean, the idea that so many people would be detained before you get a trial and in so many different types of criminal cases that have become just kind of accepted that people who have not yet been convicted of a crime would be held in, in, in jail. I mean, that's just not something we did as a country. The jail populations have just mushroomed over the past few decades. And it just, it's um, somehow this, it's a new attitude, but it's become really entrenched that uh, it's just people who have not yet been convicted of crime, doesn't matter that they're innocent until proven guilty, they could be a danger. Got to keep them, got to keep them under lock and key. So we have a couple of questions. Oh yeah. Uh, the first was who are the parties how did it come about? Um, and is there anything preventing the same sort of suit from being brought in other places? Um, and the, the, um, the lawsuits really were the brainchild of a, a guy named Alec Castanis, um, who founded a group called Equal Justice Under Law, which is now known as Civil Rights Corps. Um, and um, he, he and his group of really talented lawyers in this um, nonprofit organization started filing these lawsuits around the country and they had several um, wins, very important wins in small jurisdictions um, where there were agreements to change the system and, and there were simpler, uh, simpler uh, operations to try to change. I think it's fair to say that Harris County was probably one of the, is the biggest, um, uh, but not the first. I think, I think it, it was the fourth or fifth uh, of its kind uh, of lawsuit um, that was where they represented uh, people who were arrested and uh, charged with a misdemeanor and held in jail because they didn't have the money and um, and you know they so, you know they, they could show that that the plaintiffs were uh, really suffering um, uh, because of their detention and that and that it was really not. Uh, necessary, like in the O'Donnell lawsuit, um, Miranda O'Donnell is a, a single mom. She had a, a small child at home, and um, I, I think she was arrested for driving on a suspended license. Um, and so it just, you know, there was really no need for her to be stuck in jail. Um, so they, you know, they had pl plaintiffs like this that they uh, formed a class action. Um, judges um, and uh, other, you know, just the county in general. Um, in Harris County, one of the reasons that, uh, that the lawsuit is so interesting is that it's such a big system and they were able to, uh, Harris County sort of did them a favor um, in collecting data. And so they were able to use a lot of that, that data show um, the numbers of people being detained and the, um, 
amounts of bail that were being set and things like that. And then they started doing a lot of their own research, um, watching bail hearings, um, you know, just probably hundreds of them uh, that they watched and, um, and kept track of what was going on. So that was really, really important. Um, and yes, it, this, this kind of lawsuit can certainly be done in other places. You know, this is why I say I would prefer a legislative solution um, because you know, in, in Texas we have 256 counties, um, so that's a lot of lawsuits for one state. Uh, <laughs> um, and um, so, uh, yeah, there's another question. I don't know if you want to take it, Brandon. Um, there's a question about linking to some of our resources, and I'll share. We have we have a monitor website that I can share with our reports and some of the data that we've shared so far. Um, one of the really cool things about this consent decree is that it also calls on the county to, to make public a big data repository so that people can see what's been happening in the misdemeanor system themselves. That's, that's still being developed. Some of the data is still being linked. It, 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 it was a big, big task that the consent decree called on the county to do. They have a whole data team on their end, even forgetting about you know, our team um, that, that is putting together this big data repository. We've been really grateful, by the way. It's another wonderful Duke connection. Dr. Songman Kang, who got his PhD here at Duke. Um, his PhD advisor, Phil Cook, mentioned to me that his former student has really wonderful skills and is spending more time in the US now, although he teaches in Seoul, Korea, and, and, and might, be, might be a good person to bring in on this project. And he's been just totally invaluable. Um, and, and uh, you know, the, the, the data has, has had to be vetted and tested every step of the way. And there's been a lot of work to assemble it in a way that is clear and usable. And, you know, we've shared our findings, but the entire data set is going to be shared in this public portal. Um, but there's a, um, there, there are certainly another question is like, are nonprofits or foundations willing to fund research on, on different approaches to bail? And, and they, they certainly are. Um, you know, they're certainly like the Arnold Foundation is well known for supporting research. Uh, they developed through their funding, you know, a risk assessment that a number of jurisdictions use. Um, MacArthur has funded as part of uh, a safety and justice challenge work to focus on decarceration in sites around the country. And, 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 and they're doing work in, in Houston. Um, there are really important diversion programs and mental health treatment programs that have been funded by that, by that foundation. Uh, and so that, that's also a real change too, that, that big foundations that are interested in the criminal system have all of a sudden realized that pretrial is really important. And so there's, there has been a kind of a flowering of research. Um, one of the early studies that, that played a role um, in the O'Donnell case before we were involved in, uh, was work by folks at the Quattrone Center at, at University of Pennsylvania Law School. And they showed that people who were jailed pretrial, even with similar crimes and similar characteristics, uh, people are in the jail or um, actually more likely to repeat offend and also more likely to have harsher sentences. And so they showed that, you know, this is counterproductive from a public safety perspective and also counterproductive from a fairness perspective. They're getting hammered because they're, you know, they're trying to get out of the jail, so they'll plead guilty to harsher terms. And so there's been a lot that researchers have done. Um, but there's one last part of the question, which I think is also really interesting, which is, is it ethical to like test things out on people who are, you know, um, are in a coercive situation? They're being booked and arrested, charged with crimes. Um, I would hope that, you know, no government agency would be like running tests on people who don't have a choice about being in the, the criminal system. Um, and, uh, and that said, there are ways that you can evaluate how something is working without, without uh, and look at the cost and effectiveness of what's happening without sort of testing things out on human, human beings caught up in the criminal legal system. We're certainly, as part of our work, we're looking at overall the costs and benefits of this system. Uh, one little little piece of it we just described in our report, which is I mentioned like if it's a two thousand dollar bond, you have to pay two hundred dollars and you don't get that back. We we looked at well, what is what is the what are the dollar savings in terms of the, the, that ten percent that people had to give up in the past? 
since this rule change was adopted and so many fewer people have to pay cash bond uh, in misdemeanor cases. And it was like, it's a lot of money. It was tens of millions of dollars that people no longer, and mostly, you know, in, fairly indigent people no longer have to pay in Harris County. And that was, you know, money that they never got back again, no matter what happened in their case, their case could be dismissed, but you don't get that money back. So that's just one little type of cost. There are lots of different types of costs in a system like this, which is why the cost study is gonna be ongoing. So let me see, are there, are there other questions? Now, can I just add something to that, Brandon? Because you, you made me real, you know, the, the concern about people pleading guilty under the coercion mm -hmm. um, is very real. And there was a sort of a, a, a natural study that occurred in Houston um, that relates to some other work I did um, in, in Houston with the Crime Lab. And, um, uh, you know, at one time we had the HPD Crime Uh, the city of Houston uh, you know, undertook a really interesting um, change and they made it an independent lab and it's now considered one of the best in the, in the country, if, if not the best. And one of the things about that is that it may, you know, when you're a good lab, you're, you're an efficient lab. And so the, the lab decided that they were going to go back and test drugs from cases where people had already pled guilty. Um, been, you know, their cases were over. Now they could have just destroyed those drugs under the law, but they decided, well, they were brought to us um, for testing and we never tested it because the person pled guilty and was out of jail. Um, so there wasn't, you know, any pressing need to test it. But they said, let's test it anyway. And so they did, and they, they did hundreds of these drug tests. And what they found <laughs> was that there were, Actually, there were hundreds of people actually who they discovered had pled guilty where they either didn't have any drugs at all, like the substance wasn't drugs, um, or it was a different kind of drug or a different quantity of drug. Um, but the cases where people pled guilty and they had no drugs at all, they were pleading guilty to felonies. Uh, and it just shows how terribly coercive the system is, uh, that they preferred to, to take a felony conviction. And for, for a lot of these people, it was the only conviction they had uh, because they had to get out of jail and get back to their lives. And their lawyers were saying, well, you know, the, the police did a, a drug test out in the field and it said it was positive for cocaine. So I don't think you're gonna have a very good case. Um, so, you know, they didn't have much hope. Uh, and they could fight it, but it was going to take months. It might take six months, eight months before their cases were resolved. Uh, in so misdemeanor cases, yeah. I mean, you, you could spend more time in pretrial detention in the jail than you ever would be if you were convicted. So, it may, you know, from a rational perspective, even if you're innocent, you would plead guilty because why would you want to linger in the jail for months when, you know, they'll offer you a guilty plea for in exchange for the time you already spent. Um, yet another wrinkle though, which we have, have appreciated more and more with every month we've spent in this role is that now that people in these misdemeanor cases are mostly not lingering in the jail, they're mostly released at the time of booking. Um, it, it means though that their cases last a lot longer. Right, because they're not pleading guilty after 10 days or however many days or weeks. Um, they, they may say, okay, you know, if you're innocent, you, you might wanna take your case to trial. Well, there haven't been a lot of trials this past year because of COVID. And so if you're insisting on your right to a trial in any case, but certainly in misdemeanor cases, which are our focus, it could be, it could be a while, it could be a year, uh, it could be more. And if you're going to prepare a case for trial, well, you're going to be waiting to get like the body cam footage. You're going to be waiting to get discovery. There are going to be many more court appearances. Um, it's going to be more work for the judges to do to have a case actually proceed as a real case to be litigated. It also means that if the person is released but subject to conditions like whatever it is, drug testing or uh, meetings with a pretrial services officer every month, that you're going to be you know, subject to those conditions for a long time. 
And in the past, if you pleaded guilty after a month, maybe you get drug tested once, you meet with the pretrial services offer once, and then you know you plead guilty. Uh, now though, like people are being supervised in the community, um, which may be quite a bit better than being in the jail for months, but they'll be supervised in the community for many, many months. And if some of that supervision is counterproductive, that's gonna be harmful, harmful as well. And the pretrial services agency to its credit has been making a lot of changes to rethink what supervision is really necessary. There's a lot of research that suggests that for low level cases, people who are low risk, supervision can be really harmful. It can actually create risk by disrupting people's lives you know, for, without, without good reasons. Uh, we got a question on of the costs associated with supervision. Who pays for those costs? So the this consent decree has a, an important provision which says that if people are indigent, then they're not to be assessed costs. So that's that's really important. That's not true in a lot of places, and so and that's yet another way. It's not just cash bail, but oh, um, we'll we'll release you maybe without even cash bail. But of course, you have to be supervised and you have to pay the fee for that interlock device on your car, or you have to pay a fee every time there's a visit with a pretrial services office, or you have to pay a drug testing fee every time you do a drug test. And, and that's yet another way that, um, that poverty can cause people to be punished. And, and a supervision, it may be pretrial supervision. It may also be, oh, you know what? Uh, we can end your case now. Uh, we'll even dismiss the charges. We'll agree to a diversion. But to be in that diversion program, you know, there's supervision involved and you have to pay the costs. Um, and so, the, and these costs mount. They could be, you know, for a minor case, it could be thousands of dollars. Um, and, you know, we, we would hope that all jurisdictions would adopt this rule that if you can't pay, you can't pay and people should be treated differently based on their ability to pay. But that's just not the case. And there've been separate lawsuits brought challenging programs like that, like the diversion program, where there's really a pay to play. And so many people don't have the resources. Yeah, just in general, there's been kind of like a user fee mentality towards lots of government services. But in the criminal setting, it means that you can be, you know, jailed because you're poor. Dennis has a question as to uh, whether the, the, the data that we've uh, gotten has exceeded our expectations or fallen short? I don't, it's a good question. I'm not sure I've thought about what my expectations would be. Do, I mean, I, I think I figured they would be about this as we're seeing, which is to say not much change because, you know, it's interesting that back in the sixties, the Vera Institute of Justice did a bail study um, and they, you know, what they did is they just started paying the bail for people. Um, and they said, well, let's see what happens if we pay the bail. And so they did, and they didn't even tell people they were doing it. So, you know, these people were just getting out of jail and they were told your bail was paid. And then they tracked them and they found that they showed up to court. <laughs> um, so I think my expectations were that we wouldn't see um, much change from, you know, what we had before, which is to say people who got out showed up to court at about the same rates and committed new crimes at about the same. Yeah, what I think will be really interesting is, uh, so we, I mean, we know, we know when we have so much data now that these bail reforms resulting in tens of thousands of people being free who wouldn't have otherwise been free, haven't had harmful effects. Uh, but then there are these ne next level questions. Well, uh, could we be releasing more people? Could we be subjecting people to different conditions in a way that would help to improve outcomes? And, and how about the vulnerable people, the homeless people, the mentally ill people who keep coming back into the system? Is there something that can be learned to stop those types of revolving doors? Um, and, uh, you know, we've, we, we also wonder, you know, could, as, you know, the hearing officers, the judges get used to these new constitutional rules, Will they, will, will, can they do their work better? Can they be better informed by, by the lawyers that appear before them? Um, I mean, the hope is that not only will things not um, be, you know, not only can we show that bail reform doesn't cause harm, we wanna show uh, how continued effort to improve a system can really 
can really do greater and greater good. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm hoping that we'll be pleasantly surprised and make new discoveries in, in the future, which will provide more lessons that not only can you release more people, but, but here's how you can put more thought into the system and make it even better. Oh my goodness, the hour has is, is passed and we're out of time. Well, thank you, thank you so much for, for sharing. Thank you so much, Hunter, for, for telling folks about the work that you've been doing. And, and thank you for all of your, for all of your amazing work, which, which continues watching the bail videos, tracking the, the jail rosters each week. It, uh, it's, it's, it's been amazing work that you've, that you've done and, and, and some of your law student and undergraduate colleagues who've been part of this team are really, really grateful. And it was a treat to introduce you, Sandy, to all of our all of our Duke community friends. Thank you for for taking for taking some morning time to to meet everyone here. Thanks for having me. It was great fun. And for those of you interested in reading our reports and reading more about our monitoring work, I can I'll share the link in the chat to our um, our monitor website, and uh, and you can. You know, our report is over 100 pages, but so there's a, there's a lot to read. But but uh, we love to hear your feedback or your reactions if you take a look. Thank you.